Welcome to Girl in the Gov, the podcast. Where our goal is to make politics more accessible and less intimidating. The show features an interview with an expert in the political field, walking us through the many cues we have about politics, civics, government, and more. By providing civic education in the places we are. On our phones and in the language we speak. And yes, we know, we say like a lot. It's kind of the point. Because politics needed a rebrand. Welcome back to Girl on the Gov, the podcast. Kicking it off with another story right away that we must address, which is unfortunately another mass shooting out of Michigan on a college campus at Michigan State. So just frustrating to see this once again. We're still getting details and such about it, but I guess we'll just get into the details. Let's do it. Yeah, it's one of those things. What's what's a day in America without a mass shooting? To the point where we have kids at Michigan State who have lived through more than one mass shooting mm-hmm. at school. Yeah. So we'll read you some of the background here. So yeah, when Anthony McRae, a 43-year-old with a previous gun violation, opened fire in an area of older stately buildings on the northern edge of the campus, one of the nation's largest at over 5,000 acres. And then just across busy Grand River Avenue lies East Lansing's downtown with all their you know restaurants, bars, and shops. And so last night, alerts were sent out to students urging them to run, hide, and fight. And a video was seen was showed of them fleeing as police swarmed towards the chaos the massive search that ensued ended roughly three hours later when McRae fatally shot himself in a confrontation with police miles from campus. Officials said Tuesday, McRae was neither a student nor an employee of the university and the motive is still a mystery. And so he was actually on probation for 18 months until May of 2021 for possessing a loaded gun in a vehicle, according to the state corrections department. And there was actually in Ewing Township, New Jersey. Samantha, do you know this place? You know, I should be able to pronounce that or no, but I actually don't know this town. It must not have been in my neck of the woods. Okay, well, Ewing Township, I guess, New Jersey. (laughs) Who knows if that's how you pronounce it? There was a school district that was closed for the day after being informed that McRae, who lived in the area years ago, had a note in his pocket indicating a threat to two schools there. But it was determined there was no credible threat. Local police said later in a statement shared publicly by the superintendent. So... This is clearly an individual who just wanted to do this act in some way, in some place, in some form, it seems like. The motive seems like was just violence. And especially with, you know, him having been on probation before for, you know, a gun-related incident and this man still having access to firearms, it's just frustrating to see. Truly frustrating. It's like this just classically falls into the preventable category. There Mm -hmm. just shouldn't be access to guns like there is in this country. Yeah. Like it doesn't, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter what his motive was because no matter what, it was clearly the intent was violence and to harm people. Mm -hmm. And we as a society, we as a country more specifically, keep making it so damn easy for people to harm others. Yeah. Yeah. This is so just here's a, a situation. Example. Yeah, here's a situation where this is a person who we we know and we have known is a threat, you know, a mass shooter threat, and has been before. Why is it not impossible for this man to get a gun? Or it, like, even if I don't know if he had guns always, why have they been stripped from him? You know, it's just it's and so frustrating. You know what also, is just like from more of the you know, reducing crime element of things. Like it seems like with almost all of these shootings, there were warnings about the person. It is so rare that it seems like there wasn't like, I don't know, 10 red flags that were popping up about whoever it was and what their intents were. And it seems like, why don't we, if we're spending all this money on law enforcement, why on earth are law enforcement failing to stop these people from doing these acts? Yeah, it's beats me. It's just the same issue once again 
you know, where Sam and I, and I'm sure everyone are broken records at this point. I, I just don't know what to say anymore. Like call your senators, call your senators. Uh, I don't, don't not do that. It's just obviously frustrating to tell you guys to do that over and over again when clearly nothing's getting done, but obviously like it can't stop from us. We can't just, you know, accept this norm, even though it has become the norm. I still think Biden should sign an executive order, even though it's probably wouldn't come to fruition, just be su- and he'd just be sued. But just like he said in the State of the Union, do something. Right. So Biden, do something. And that, that would be more of a symbolic gesture, but it'll be something, you know? Right. So yeah, call your senators. Hopefully it won't just be, you know, Biden calling families again, but maybe some really forceful action of some sort to address this. It's just fucking wild that we're still here. I don't, I don't know what else to say. Really, truly wild. Yeah. <sighs> well, well, we have two yeah. other two other stories. Two, well, actually three. 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 I'm like, why I was in top stories today? Because I feel like a lot of stuff broke today, especially some election updates. Samantha, mm-hmm. do you want to kick us off with the first one? Well, this, you know what, this, I was thinking about this one for a while. So Nikki Haley officially announced that she is running for president. First official competitor in the race against good old orange man, AK Trump. And this has been like such an interesting strategy, which will also relate to the next update we give of where campaigns like do like a soft launch of we're going to announce in the next few weeks that we're officially running for office. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, so we've got the precursor to the precursor to the precursor. Like, No, they're really taking on the soft launch of it all. The it cultural is, soft oh launch. <laughs> it is the, it's literally the soft launch. I can't. It's literally the soft launch. Nikki Haley did a soft launch and now she did a hard launch. So she is mm-hmm. in it. And interestingly, or for some of like the backstory too, is she had previously said that she was not going to, you know, put her hat in the ring. And now here we are. But I feel like that's such a classic politician thing. Like if you've run for yeah. some type of elected office in some way, I feel like you can never rule out that person running for something else at some point. It doesn't matter how many times they're like, oh, oh my God, no, totally. I've, I've hung up the old hat. Like, I'm good. N- no. Yeah. No, no, no. No, agreed. That's like even me thinking, like, if there is a world in which Biden doesn't seek reelection, like, you know, Gavin Newsom's going to come out and be like, you know what? Maybe I will run. <laughs> but like percent. before, he was like, absolutely not. I'm not running like Biden's best president. Like, no, you know. But yeah, first major challenger, official challenger is Donald Trump. So it's those two that are officially in the race right now. I don't know if there's any like other random ass people, but those are the two main names. DeSantis hasn't officially announced yet. So guys, the Republican primary is kicking off. We'll say that. I'm curious to see some of Trump's thoughts and how he's going to come after her. She's also been a Trump like flip flopper. Like she's been like Mm. a Trumper. And then she like pulled it back when he didn't condemn like white supremacist stuff. I think she... She pulled up back her support and then like that didn't work for her with the base. And so she kind of went back, you know, so she's been all over the place. So it'll be interesting to see her, her strategy here and how she, yeah, what kind of stances she takes. Right. Cause, and I can't remember who this was. So classic. I really need to start writing people's names down as I witness things on the, the world wide web. But there was this comment made about the distinction between Republican candidates and how it's going to he, Trump will be hard to beat in the essence that all of them will be like, I like his policies. I just don't, you know, like his messaging yeah. or I like his policies, but he's on the older side. I like his yeah. policies, but as opposed to being like, no, we are different people. Yeah, like totally. By or like a candidate, the, the, a candidate like, that's just going to be the policies and not the extra shit. Yeah, that's like what the Republican Party needs. It's just crazy that they haven't fully caught on to that yet. I mean, I don't know. Fine by me. Fine Fine by by me. me. So yeah, big election update there. Another one was Dianne Feinstein officially Mm -hmm. said that she will not be running. So that opens up her race to whoever else wants to throw their hat in the ring. Right now, it's Adam Uh, Schiff and Katie Porter. There's a few other hopefuls that people are predicting might might throw throw in, but we will see. We will see. I mean, it's just thank you for officially Feinstein like telling us this. You're not running. The idea of her even thinking about running again. How old is she again? 82 or something? She's 89. I'm I'm, hold on. Double check. Double check. No, I think you're right. Yeah, 89. 
you guys like imagine imagine like wild but- and honestly i like that this is just such a great example of you can do really amazing work but like there's a time to be like okay we've checked you know what this off now move on yeah. to something else like it doesn't mean that she has to retire at all from like working in the public sphere it's just like at this particular point you've done not done your time but like you've really you've put in the years here now like give the you know hand it over to someone else no totally and we talk about this on the political mic podcast right Mm -hmm. and somebody i forget who said it was like it just shows like how obsessed everyone is in dc with this power grab of just like holding on to this power so much like we're raised our entire lives like our entire culture and society is like work and then you get to retire and like never work again and just go rest on a beach like but not in dc like no everyone Mm -hmm. wants their power grab and it just should be an ode to you know the i guess intentions behind some of our some of our electeds on both sides of the aisle and how it's so much most bipartisan thing ever yeah and i think it's like everyone wants their claim to fame everyone and look i i'm a leader and i think they get a lot of sneaky money under the table so don't sleep on that fair and facts Mm -hmm. but like i don't think she's exactly struggling oh no she lives right next to the anson pack heights in her mansion like i just i wonder if i'm saying I just saw the press release from Nancy. I haven't read it yet about the announcement. But mm-hmm. nonetheless, one other story that we must address is something that we also talked about on Political Mike's podcast for a hot minute, which was last week, Mike Pence officially got subpoenaed. And the big question was like whether he was going to you know, participate and help out and or whether he was going to fight it. And this, this today, it came out that he's going to fight it. So former Vice President Mike Pence is planning to fight a subpoena by the special counsel overseeing investigations into efforts by Trump and his allies to overturn the 2020 election, aka all of the things that came with that. So Pence and his attorneys are planning to cite constitutional grounds as they prepare to resist special counsel Jack Smith's efforts to compel his testimony before a grand jury. They argue that because Pence was serving in his role as president of the Senate on January 6, 2021, as he presided over a joint session of Congress to certify the election results, he is protected from being forced to address his actions under the Constitution's, quote, speech or debate clause that shields members of Congress. And a close advisor to Pence said, I think he views it as an essential protection of his constitutional role. I Which think is it interesting. Like a bunch of bogus, but I didn't know this was a protection that members of Congress had. Yeah, me um, neither. You learn something new every day. Another, another, you know, lesson that it's a big lesson. T- two in a week. Who know? Totally. Which, if you guys don't know what we're talking about, go back to top stories and you'll hear. You'll Just figure know it there's out. an architect a- of Congress, and mm-hmm. we go over what that role does because it's not yeah. what you think. It's not what you think. What um. Best- Speaking of plot twist, this is one. Yeah. I I kind of did think he was going to comply, you know? I honestly didn't have a gut feeling either way. I think yeah. I just, this is one of those where. <sighs> yeah. It's not and that I don't, I don't think it's important. It's just more of like, I, I don't even, I don't know, man. You know, it's like, it, it's a classic, I don't know, man situation. Yeah. And it's also a classic, we'll keep you updated situation. That's so. okay, fair. We'll see what happens with all this, but wild, wild stuff. A lot of news broke today, but like Sam said, go listen to Top Stories. We talk about a few things, so just, a few just things. go listen. A little listen. this, a little that. Yeah, mm. but we also have an amazing interview today. We do. We have Iris Harvey on the show, and she is the CEO and president of Planned Parenthood Advocates Ohio. And we're chatting about the ballot measure. They are trying to get up and running as part of a coalition in the state to protect reproductive rights. So there are a lot of details, a lot of process processes that we walk through, but also just get some of the background on Ohio's political landscape, which I think is really interesting. And I think we've only covered a tidbit amazingly back with our an interview that we did about maybe like over a year ago. So we're we're dipping back into Ohio a little bit. We're doing a little, you yeah. know, check in moment, but obviously around reproductive rights. So regardless, we'll let you guys get into it. So without further ado, here's Iris. 
All right, Iris Harvey, the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Advocates of Ohio. We are so excited to welcome you to the show. We have a lot to get to today when it comes to reproductive rights in the state of Ohio. But we want to set the scene. We want to know more about your work first and foremost. And so if you wouldn't mind telling us how you got into this work and what your role at Planned Parenthood Advocates looks like. Okay. Well, that's a big question. (laughs) I have been involved with Planned Parenthood for all of a decade and like one in five women in America, you know, as as a teenager had the opportunity to use Planned Parenthood. I got intimately involved and formally in around a decade ago. First, I joined the Planned Parenthood of Ohio board when we were multiple affiliates across the state, three across the state. I joined to, you know, do my volunteer work as the board and became board chair and uh, and had actually had the opportunity to um, recruit the, a new board, uh, not board, a new CEO when we merged our organization. And after three years, that CEO had an interest in moving on to another part of Planned Parenthood. And I thought, well, now I can recruit again, which is a lot of time. And the board said to me, would you be interested in doing something different in your career and take the CEO position? So in 2016, I stepped in a very important year (laughs) as the president of Planned Parenthood of Greater Ohio, which also includes Planned Parenthood Advocates of Ohio. And the rest is history. Here I am today. I love it so much. Well, I... I mean, I'd be shocked if people don't know what Planned Parenthood is these days. One of your your guys' biggest fans, first of all. Second of all, you guys do a range of work from actually like providing healthcare to then lobbying and doing a lot on the political side as well. Can you kind of explain the difference between the Planned Parenthood arm and the Planned Parenthood Act's arm? Great. Good question. So I'll even go one step above. You know, Planned Parenthood is a, a federation of affiliates nationwide and Planned Parenthood affiliates. So Planned Parenthood of Greater Ohio is the health. It's a 501c3 and it is a health care provider, just like you would go to any private practice. We specialize in sexual and reproductive health care. And we directly deal with our patients and take on the responsibility of ensuring that there is equity in the health care that we deliver. Planned Parenthood Advocates of Ohio is a 501c4. And as you suggested, that is our C arm. And it truly, the way I like to think of the two parts is our 501c3 is the provider of great health care. Our 501c4 is the protector of great mm. productive health care. So they're that. in, as you suggested, is the advocacy, the policy development, and the strong engagement with our community to make sure our supporters are involved in letting our legislators and others know the importance of our work and how they feel about the work in their communities. Totally makes sense. I was curious. It's like, okay, there's two here within this larger bubble. What do they do and how do they work together? And that definitely gives us some color to that context. And another context that we want to paint, give some light to, is what reproductive rights right now looks like in the state of Ohio. Since you are on the ground, you're seeing it, you're dealing with it. What does that look like today? And also pre-Roe, what did that look like? Right. Well, right now, given the Dobbs decision, which has put bans across the country and has essentially said that abortion rights are not included in our constitution, right now in Ohio, abortion is legal. And it's really important for your podcast listeners to know it's legal up to 21 weeks and six days. And, you know, we also provide in addition to that, you know, sex education, we provide STI testing and cancer screenings and a variety of areas. So abortion is still legal in Ohio. Um, But it is legal in Ohio, primarily due to our ability to get an injunction 
against a six-week ban, which the Ohio State Legislature had passed some time ago. And as soon as the Dobbs decision went into effect, they rushed in the six-week ban and our advocacy arm rushed in with our reproductive health, reproductive justice and rights groups such as the ACLU. This is when you really love lawyers, right? And <laughs> and we asked for a preliminary injunction and we have one. So for abortion, it's still legal in Ohio. Mm-hmm. And can you also paint the picture of really what the state legislature looks like in Ohio? Who, you know, who holds the power yeah. there? Well, the state legislature in Ohio is very conservative. It is a supermajority of of GOP legislators, our governor, the attorney general, our, our, our secretary of state. So all of the key cabinet positions are indeed not just GOP, but anti-abortion, if you think of it from the, the standpoint of the work that we do. So, you know, over the years, in the 10 years that I've been here, we have seen, you know, just scores of legislature, legislative actions that limit access to, that make it what we call trap laws. They make make it more difficult for people to access abortion. They make it longer in terms of the process that it takes. The unconsciousable is they forced us to do unnecessary medical procedures, such, for instance, as an ultrasound. They require consent for, for minors. And you name it, they require that we have an, an ambulatory surgical type of environment for patients to come in. So all of those things are harmful in terms of patients exercising their right to quick access to a procedure, abortion, which is one of the most safe procedures that you can have, probably, you know, 20 times safer than what happens in in giving birth. So it's a very conservative environment. We have a governor who signs just about any legislation that comes through. And while we have great partners in the Democratic and and occasionally some good partners that are in the Republic that are in the Republican Party, but most of the time their legislative actions get passed and we either fight them and get some type of preliminary action or they go into effect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned something called a trap law. Can you elaborate just a little bit on what that is and right. the motives behind sure. doing something like that? Exactly. So they're, they're targeted restrictions that are designed to make access to abortion more difficult and more expensive and to stigmatize. So they can be everything from, as I just, I just described, a longer waiting time. So that means, for instance, there are only maybe nine actual provider clinics in Ohio. So if you say you have to have multiple visits, if you have to come day one and get education and you have to have an ultrasound and you have to listen to a doctor tell you um, things that are not true, that having an abortion could cause cancer. And then after all that, you have to see, you know, whether or not there's a fetal heartbeat, and then you have to go home and reflect on whether the decision that you're making for yourself, your family, and your body, those Mm -hmm. are the examples of trap laws. So the stigma and the inconvenience to a patient, and then the additional burden of costs and really resources that are required for the providers. Yeah. Well, We want to talk about, too, a little bit how we got here, how Ohio has gotten here. I think it's always such an interesting state politically, and we've seen it kind of be this big swing state and be kind of a purple state where we've really seen it lately be pretty red. And especially when looking at this issue of abortion, like we want to know why and if this is the the new norm or what we think about this. But what are your thoughts on this trajectory for Ohio kind of getting onto this more red page? Well, you know, I'm not by birth an Ohioan, and I've been here for a little bit more than actually longer than I thought I'd be here. (laughs) Almost, (laughs) almost, almost two decades. As a matter of fact, I moved to Ohio the day after President Obama was elected. So that's how long I've been here. And as you said, Ohio has often been 
a purple state. But over time, I think, especially the 26, 2016 election galvanized people who are conservative, who have concerns about the changing population in America, and who, you know, there's a bit of a heartland mentality and, you know, values here, and so are just not comfortable with abortion. And of course, that's your right individually to not to be comfortable with it. But what we've seen is that politicians who target a specific base see that that moves their base and their base moves to vote. And so that's where that's where we are. And whether or not we'll turn purple again, I would say not anytime soon, because there's been a lot of redistricting happen, Mm -hmm. happened happened in Ohio. And they basically have made it almost impossible for Democratic or liberal candidates to win in elections. And, you know, they've literally built, they've taken and split districts so that one Democratic candidate is on one side of the street and her district is on the other side. So the trickery that has got us to this point where not only do they think this way, but they act and enact laws in the same Mm -hmm. way. The trickery. Yeah. Seriously. Well, I do think it's interesting too, looking at Ohio in the sense that there's so much innovation happening there and so many companies moving there and promising to invest there, which means that people are going to potentially move to that state. But then if, you know, you have a uterus, I think you second guess that and think, well, what are my rights in that state? Like I know personally, I would have a really hard time then moving to a state where I knew my reproductive freedom and rights were going to be on the line. So I think it's going to be interesting to see like what that looks like, or if people will choose the jobs essentially over their, you know, potential healthcare. And if then in sort of choosing that, that they change the electorate a little bit, or Mm -hmm. if it does continue to stay the same, or even if it changes that the gerrymandering will be still so bad that it doesn't even matter. It doesn't have the impact. Yeah. yeah. You make a good point. And I look at this from perspectives. Before I was in healthcare, I was in higher education. And one of the things that we saw in higher education was a decline in the population of college age young people. So that that had two things. Number one, Ohio was part of you know, the Midwestern industrial area, right? And so as industry has moved off of our shores and moved other places, the good paying jobs that didn't require a college education that were great blue collar jobs, unionized, have declined substantially. And what also became part of that was that you had generations of people whose Parents worked in these good industrial areas, and so their expectation was that they could also have a good Midwestern life, a good Mm -hmm. good Midwestern lifestyle by not going to college. And then that changed. And so you started to see the need for more people to make different decisions about education. But you also started to see people who have made decisions about education and the careers that they want to start to leave the state of Ohio. And a professor at Case Weston, you know, Cleveland State University, when I first moved here, had done a really interesting analysis. And one of the things that he found was that Ohio, during this meltdown of industry, had actually lost more people than New Orleans or New New Orleans lost during Katrina. So you had that outflow of people through a catastrophe And another type of a catastrophe was happening here in Ohio. So young people are starting to look at, is this a place, maybe it's great education and colleges, we have wonderful universities, but also as state universities, they are not supported in a generous way. Mm -hmm. So you also have high tuition. So I think they are leaving the state. And so if we don't change our politics, if we don't change the welcoming of people, regardless of your race, your religion, or your gender identity, 
then why would you move here, right? Why would you stay and raise a family? Totally. It's so, so interesting to think about. But we, you know, in looking at all this, we also want to look at the solutions that you guys are working on, especially around reproductive freedom and access in the state. You are all part of a coalition working to protect abortion access in Ohio. Can you kind of tell us first a little bit about that coalition and who's involved and then also kind of your guys' work to work on this ballot measure, which we're going to dive into. But can you kind of explain all of that backstory with this coalition building you guys have been doing? Well, you know, to do a good ballot initiative, you need a coalition, regardless of the topic, right? And Mm -hmm. so across the country, we have traditional partners who are reproductive rights and reproductive justice advocates, number one being the ACLU. Uh, But here in Ohio, we work with a Ohio Women's Alliance. We work with what's called Pro-Choice Ohio, which is also at a national level, NARAL. We we work with URGE. We work with a variety of organizations that have at the top of their priority safeguarding reproductive health and, and access to it. And so we've worked together over decades for many things. So the natural tendency is indeed to look at how we could consider a ballot initiative. And if you look at Kansas, if you look at, and if you look at Vermont, again, those coalitions included some of the same type of people, especially the ACLU and Planned Parenthood. So we have both the long and deep history in doing it. So if you look at Planned Parenthood and the ACLU, the ACLU protecting rights, right? And Planned Parenthood, not only protecting rights, but we have a special interest in that we are providers of it. So nothing is ever easy. In the state of Ohio, we also have a group of of physicians from podiatrists to, you know, OBGYNs and pathologists and a variety of physicians who also have gotten on the bandwagon and are very eager to have a ballot initiative presented. And so I think there is no disagreement in Ohio. Those of us who support rights believe that our only approach now is a ballot initiative. At one point, we did ask the Supreme Court to do the enshrining of it. But so we are now several coalition groups working collectively And as you know, the language, what I say to you as a voter, right, is so important. And Mm -hmm. and and the way we know how important it is to you is through rigorous testing. So we are now collectively the coalition of Planned Parenthood, ACLU, a variety of uh, groups and this doctor's group, Ohio Physicians for Choice, I believe their name is, we have come together and decided to test a set of languages, so, you know, to see if we've gotten it right, the collective, or anything is put together <laughs> to yeah. do this business. Well. So, you know, I, I think that's the first part of it. The other part of a ballot initiative is, of course, you have to deal with the bureaucracy, right? You have to have your secretary of state approve mm-hmm. the ballot and approve the language and how it will will happen. So we're at the very first part of of that stage, right? Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is we anticipate that, and the state legislature has said that they plan to introduce a ballot to change the passing of a ballot initiative from a simple majority, 50%, God, that's supposed to be so American, right? To 60%. And so I, I think that's going to complicate the complicate the, the ballot initiative if they introduce it at the same time that we're doing it. And it's hard to say, I don't think the redness of the state will really make a 60% ballot change work. You know why? Because everyone likes to use a ballot initiative to get what they want, right? And so yeah. just as we want to use it for good. We think those who are anti-choice and anti-abortion rights and, you know, a variety of rights that people should consider human will also say, is this 
the platform, I want to give up the ballot initiative that raised the bar so high. So I think it's anyone's guess as to whether or not that will be introduced. And if so, will it pass? And the same power of volunteers who are interested in going door to door and enlisting voters would probably be the same ones who would want to say, you can't change a 50% vote to 60 So that's how you put the people's voice back in the mix is by making sure that you give them the opportunity to speak up when their voice is is actually trying to be drowned out. Yeah. No, a lot of politicking for sure. I also have a random question about back to the coalitions and everything. Um, I just found it really interesting that you said that there is like a range of healthcare providers from like ophthalmologists involved. I'm just curious what the strategy is there. Like I, is it because I guess it's just so obvious that OBGYNs are going to stand up and say, you know, this needs to be a right and provide healthcare to everyone. Is it like mm-hmm. bringing in these other doctors from different fields? You know, well, what is kind of the strategy yeah. there? I, I think there's a couple. Number one, I think doctors believe that, you know, they should speak up for this and they should, right? Obviously not all of them are providers. But I think the other thing is if you look at many of the trap laws and stigma across the country, physicians are also targeted, right? It makes Mm -hmm. it illegal. You can go to jail. And so I think that it's probably also a natural see for physicians to want to lead in protecting. And, you know, that makes sense. But I think it's also just really important that that we work together because what I might protect as my medical practice could be very different from what I protect from a patient's right to access, right? And there can be negotiation on that. And we know that the people who are the most vulnerable, who have the least access to rights are the people who get hurt with this. And to the extent that you're not really thinking about that person, those people, if you're not every day dealing with providing care to those people, you are thinking about, am I going to have my license taken away? So for instance, in Ohio, one of the the six-week bans and some of the conversation they had, it would take a doctor who left Ohio and went to another state. The long arm of prosecution could go to that other state and take their license there and here, right? And so that's scary, right? But it's also scary for a person who has to travel to another state to get the care that they need. So hence, we are trying to make sure that we work collaboratively so that we have the best opportunity to get a ballot initiative that really does put abortion access fully available to um, people who need it and protects physicians who are providers of it. And I love abortion providers, they provide the care every day. Absolutely. And so great to hear that all those perspectives are coming together and being a part of the conversation of how you guys are forming, you know, the language around what this ballot measure will eventually look like. And that leads us to that next question of what is next? What's the next steps in this process? What comes, you know, in the coming months for the ballot measure? Yeah. Well, uh, the next step are indeed testing the language, right? We need to make sure we have it right and uh, uh, right enough that it can be appealing to a large enough number of voters. The next thing is sort of out of our hands in that we do have to submit it to the state and the secretary of state has to approve what the language can be and approve our getting access to actually running a ballot initiative. So there is what I would call the procedural and bureaucratic next steps that we don't have a lot of control over. And all of that will happen in, you know, the next few weeks. And of course, there is the difference between ballot initiative happening in 2023 
And I'll ask you, what is not happening in 2020? It's an off year for elections. Ah, Makes things tricky. That's why I'm here talking to you guys. Yes, you're absolutely right. You got it, girls and and gov. And of course, 2024, we do have an election year. And we do know, you know, we like to say that, uh, you know, everyone said in the 2022 election, it was going to be the economy, right? Well, it really was abortion rights. People stood up for for that access. And so I like to say to people, thank you. We didn't mind saving the democracy. And so <laughs> we do know that there are many advantages to being in an election year. One is that you have people who are coming to the polls that you don't have to drive there. So those are the complications that will happen in the next steps. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I was gonna say, I know with New York, they just passed sort of the next steps and the big conversation of not having it on the ballot in 2023, even though there's some local elections and pushing it to 2024. Because if no one, you know, or the only extremes that typically show up on these like smaller elections just come out like What's that going to do? Is that actually going to get something passed even in New York, which is typically pretty blue? So it's interesting seeing the strategy behind this of actually putting it into a place where it can become law, not just doing it for the sake of doing it, which is fun. But I think it takes a little too much effort to do it for the sake of doing it. You know, I just. Yeah. Yeah. I hope everyone listens sure. to your podcast. <laughs> yeah, we want to make sure it comes to fruition. And then <laughs> speaking of, we want yeah, to like yeah. also ask what, you know, how Ohioans can help you guys in this effort and, you know, what you kind of need from the collective of voters and everyone in Ohio to yeah. kind of help get behind this. Yeah, well, you know, there are multiple things. You know, there, uh, of course, is a sort of a playbook with ballots. And I won't say that I'm the world's expert on it. But doing this testing and getting the language right is is step one. You know, step two is the negotiation and the dance with the state on what we actually can put on the ballot and the permission uh, to get on the ballot. Then the hard part starts. The hard part is twofold. First, and you hate to always put this first, but is raising the money because especially in a non-election year, you have you have to convince people to come out to an election that isn't already set up. So that's the the next big step is to galvanize volunteers, galvanize canvas workers, galvanize the people who will knock on the door. And of course, ballot initiatives are legal documents and very prickly. So there's a great deal of training that needs to go on to make sure you don't get hundreds of thousands of them thrown away. And then it gets down to ultimately money fundraising, right? And so we know like Michigan and Kansas cost, you know, anywhere from 40 to maybe $60 million to have a ballot. So wow. those, those are the big next steps, getting it right, getting the language right, getting the people who will get the signatures trained and on board and the money to come into the state. And, you know, you you don't necessarily raise all of the money in the state. This is a national issue. And so, you know, of course, we talk to donors and others who are looking to to preserve reproductive rights to also come in and and stand with the, the ballot supporters. Totally. Wow. Michigan, that is wild. We did an episode on that initiative as well, but didn't know sort of the cost and the figures there. Mm -hmm. But I know that in our conversation, we were talking about a lot of the ads that were coming out against the initiative and sort of like the, you know, the counter marketing that was happening. And so having the funds available to actually move stuff along and get the, get people out was a huge, huge lift. And I think when people think about elections, they think about the candidates and donating to candidates and sometimes smartly and sometimes not so smartly, but they Mm -hmm. know the name. And so they just throw money at it and hope for the best and then they lose. You know, there's (laughs) all of those rants, but I think that's something that's really underspoken about for lack of, that's not an actual term, but now it is underspoken. Oh my God. Is donating to, you know, ballot initiatives because those are 
campaigns too. And there seems to be this marketing separation between candidates and ballot initiatives. And I feel like that's something that needs to be brought into a little bit more unity when thinking about political giving. It's like that yeah. is just as important, if not way more important, because especially right to- now. Totally. Yeah. 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 And I, I think you're right. You know, one of the things that happened is with these ballot initiatives that we did in 22, there's less of a separation between them and a candidate because candidates saw, so candidates who were pro-abortion rights had a, a platform to stand on in terms of telling their public and their constituency where they stood on that. And then they saw how the marketplace voted with them. And, and so I think as we go forward, it's it's the same thing that you would translate to another marketplace to be able to say that it aligns with an ongoing election and it's it's additive to what's happening and you don't have to build it all by yourself and have an, you know a year of of work when there is not the momentum of e- electoral work happening so mm-hmm. we'll see how it all turns out but right yes. now The important thing is getting the language work, working together and collaborative. And, you know, that type of effort then says to those donors who want to be part of turning Ohio back to purple, have reason. You know, you don't want to go into a market if you think, oh, I don't know if it's going to. It's always, there's always a possibility that you won't win, right? But Mm -hmm. The headwinds that you want is this sense that we got this. We're mm-hmm. going to win. So that's that's what we're all working towards. Absolutely. We love that. Well, is there anything else when we before we close that you can plug here so that all of our listeners can either get involved or call up all their friends in Ohio? Or what are some action items people can take away from this episode? That That, that is really good. So I, I want to say this because it is is so important. Abortion is still legal in Ohio, and that that is very important because there is so much chatter going on, and there's so much about the anti-abortion movements that people are never quite sure. I want anyone in Ohio who has that need to know that we have navigators, and if there is something about our restrictions that make it difficult for you to have an abortion in Ohio, we have a navigator, social worker to talk to you, to listen to your emotional needs, to listen to your financial needs, and to get you to another state where you can get this, this the health care that you need, number one. Mm-hmm. I think number two, I, I want everyone to think about how important a constitutional ballot for abortion would be to the state. And so whether it's 22 or 24, that they are aware of it, they give us good feedback on the language and that they come out and vote, right? And if we have to face a 60% instead of a simple majority, that they really come out and vote against that one. Amen to that. Amen. Oh my goodness. That 60% is giving me the stress already, but regardless, we will hopefully get everyone out there. I'm personally just so excited that this is in the works. Yeah. I just, ballot initiatives to me are just the unsung heroes. So Truly. Again, this makes me so happy. And I'm so glad that we were able to chat with you and more learn more about this specific ballot initiative. And we're excited for everyone to learn more as well. So thank you so Great. much. Thank you. We'll we'll keep you up to date as, as we make progress. And thank you for having an interest in and in talking about what's happening in Ohio and the access to the human rights access to making decisions about our bodies. So Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. And thank you for the work you do. Thank you. You take care.